Okay, so bees are looking for pollen, probably the biggest thing. They're looking for uh, pollen as early in the season, we're talking March, all the way through into August. There's different bees that'll show up and they're all looking for pollen, okay? Two, they're looking for um, pollen probably from more native plants, uh, so we're looking for heirlooms, uh, a, a double blossom, something. Your hybrids are designed for humans, not for bees, because there's not a lot of pollen in those things. So native plants, pollen. Um, a clean environment. So I'm now looking for less lawn treatment, less sprays into the yard. Um, and then uh, last piece, bees look for uh, a place to nest. Okay? There's a lot of bees in the ground, so three quarters of the bees are in the ground in a yard. If your yard's only grass and beauty bark and maybe asphalt or a roof or whatever, these bees can't get through to the ground. So leave a little, in the corners of your yard, just leave little places where um, bees can go tunnel into the ground. Or there are other bees out there that actually nest in holes. And so hole nesting bees, by putting out uh, small, medium, and large holes in a yard, these bees are looking for small bees, are looking for small holes, big bees are looking for big holes. Um, they're looking for holes. So put these holes um, around your house. And your little house, my company, Crown Bees, is, carries these things. Um, but we're trying to find these bees, and this is, this is what they're looking for. So pollen, some place to live, and a clean environment, those three things. Bees are facing um, a tough environment. We're taking their normal habitat and changing it to farmland, to roads, to urban settings. And the answer is um, kind of tough luck. There's not much you can do about that. I'm going to say lack of habitat, lack of uh, pollen where these places used to have it uh, would be, well, and, and probably chemag. Uh, we're just putting a lot of crud out there, whether it's in my yards or on the streets, going to the, you know, probably those three things um, are impacting it. And the, and the answer um, really comes down to what can you do about this? Um, plant flowers. You know, let's just add, uh, put holes around your house. Let's add some habitat for these people, or for these bees that um, might not have it today. When we say monarch, butterfly, and we say honeybee, kind of really says there's only really one butterfly and there's really only one bee. You know, when, and I don't know how many butterflies there are in the world species, but in the bee side there's like 24,000, so we're only talking about one there. The monarch is a great, um, save the monarch and maybe you'll save all the other butterflies that are having their issues. I think, from all I've read, a lot of chemicals, um, but this is a migratory butterfly that starts up in North you know, America and goes all the way down to uh, Central Mex Mexico. I think from what I've read, um, a lot of the bands of pollen as you're coming down there and you've just got soybeans or corn and the butterflies just can't get across these barriers, these pollinator pathways. And so they're probably stopping and dying there instead of migrating south. And the thing down in Mexico, uh, a lot of the places where they used to land are becoming um, less and less available. And I, I think there's probably other reasons that are going on out there, but those two things I believe are one of the major issues with the monarch. And um, you know, again, less chemicals probably in your yard would be good. A little, add a little more pollen. You know, I think every every butterfly, every bee would probably thank you for that. Not a farmer. I am a uh, as a food eater. Um, I don't appreciate the fact that we are um, putting a lot of crud on my food. <clears throat> I, I recognize why we need to do this. Farming uh, used to be polyculture, where there was a lot of things all grown on your acreage. Nowadays, we've got monoculture, where there's just one big extent of apples or wheat. Problem is when you shift to something that's all one thing, that's not working with nature, and nature's gonna work against you. So I can take from this side root rot, and because I've got root rot, man, it just runs right through your apple fields. Or I've got some fungus, it runs right through. So because of monoculture and how we're farming, we've got to add, um, we've got now too many pests in here, we have too many funguses, so we've got to, we've got to treat it with chemicals because we're working with, against nature. That tends to be our solution. I think uh, that's not healthy for the environment. I think it, um, I, I'm confident that 
these chemicals are getting into our waterways and ultimately creating dead spots Yeah, down there uh, south of Florida. Uh, we're, we're creating all sorts of uh, downstream issues. Probably one of, the, one of the pieces that I'm starting to understand, there's a, um, an ecologically sound golf course around me in Washington State. As I'm talking with these guys, they're saying, oh, this is the coolest research. Here's grass, and we're being told to put these chemicals and fertilizers on, on grass, and, and here's the mix. He goes, well, we're working with this one scientist across, I don't know, he's a German or something, and they're realizing that, well, grass is in the cousin family of corn, and actually the fertilizer concentration that we're actually using is based on corn. And so we're being told to put, you know, fertilizer and chemicals in for the corn, not the grass. And so as we're looking at it, most, he said 90% or more than that, of all the stuff isn't being used by the grass and it's just washing away downstream. So we've adjusted our fertilizers to be 5% of what we've been doing and our grass is just fine. But this misunderstanding of, um, of how we should be fertilizing if we need to, I think is another big issue that we're, we're doing a lot of damage by making assumptions. So out of maybe the 340 million people in the U.S., um, studies maybe four years ago showed there was about maybe 42 million yards, so maybe uh, I'd say an eighth maybe or, um, of the people grow. And that's probably um, a tomato plant or a cherry tree to, man, I've got a whole backyard just beans and carrots and peas. And so be between all that, um, that's awesome. Uh, where my company is actually headed right now, we're working with um, a couple organizations that are more community-based, and we're trying to shift, uh, it's going to take a while, uh, communities and towns and cities to have edible landscapes. And the intent with this, uh, we've got a couple of these in Seattle. You and I can just walk on down and grab an apple off a tree and eat it because I'm in the community and it's, it's, it's ours. So in some of these other communities, communities that we're starting to see across the U.S., we're having beans that you can just pull off because it's in the right-of-ways. It's in between the sidewalk and the street. It's edible landscape that has flowers, will need bees, um, but can you turn your community into more of a community event? This is all, or a community, I say event. We're all uh, growing food. That's where I think we need to head. It can happen. Word of mouth. Get your, you know, get your legislature, get your city council involved, get your urban, you know, get your schools involved. It's so stinking easy. And you're putting down the stuff that does, you're working on the permaculture side. You don't have to water it all the time. You well, what we're learning, um, bees that nest in holes, native bees that nest in holes, um, I can take this from my yard and then give this to your yard, okay? So a bee that nests in a hole, a cavity nester, I can move around. We know out of the 4,000 species of bees in North America, um, roughly 20 to 25% nest in holes. So where are they, okay? We have three of them. We've got the blue orchard bee, it's in the kind of Northwest, it's kind of found in most states. We have a leaf cutter bee that we kind of raise out of Saskatchewan, it's kind of everywhere. We have bumblebees that are manufactured in Mexico and kind of spun around, and they're all kind of, they're there. We have them. But that's leaving 997 other species out there. And here's, here's the piece. The bees that live in Toledo, Ohio, and are naturally there, are perfect for the Toledo, Ohio, Ohio environment. And the bees of Tallahassee and of Seattle, all these different bees are out there, and we honestly don't know much about them. Yeah, I had someone just north of me, a couple hours north of me, put out a bunch of holes in his yard and just in an a urban setting, and he had five different species. Said, Dave, what are these? We looked at them, well, I kind of recognized one of them, and the other four, they're bees. So my company is looking to create a, a native bee network, so we're trying to connect it. We're asking people, and we're, we're actually in a programmatic state, I'm going to give someone a, a bunch of holes, you know, low cost, to these, to these organizations, master gardeners, and um, conservation districts, let's go put these holes in a, in a big, you know, uh, pipe, bunch of little holes, 
let's go place them into fields and along roadways and right-of-ways and in backyards and let's go find what bees are there. And it's kind of a little multi-year uh, program. We'll find out the first year what nested here, we'll kind of look at it and then put those same bees back to there. And did they come back? Did they propagate? So all of a sudden now we've got, um, after two or three years, we've got a lot of um, two types of bees in Toledo, Ohio that really stand out. Okay, well let's now actually learn a little more. Let's actually start raising these bees. So we're now putting them in propagation cages and we're working with the scientists to do this as ethically as we can. And eight years, nine years from now, we're actually placing these into organic farms with the intent to use a local bee in a local crop to get more food. And so if anyone is listening um, and you're interested, you know, let us know, info at crownbees.com. We want to work with you. We want to find these bees in North, in North America, so Canada and, and the U.S. And this same statement, these same bees, the variety of bees that are out there, are, um, there's different bees in Ecuador and Ethiopia. We know there's whole nesting bees in Haiti. I mean, the bees are there across the world and we just got to find them. And when we put these bees into farmlands, and this is, this is science, farmers are getting 25 to 300 percent more yield by using native bees, not the honeybees. And it's just, it's a, it's a crazy idea. No, it's not. It's natural. Let's go start this. And so I'm going to say, to kind of finish this little statement, there's two times to plant a cherry tree, 20 years ago and today. Okay? So if we fast forward 20 years from now, hopefully we can look back to today and say, thank God we started then. Because now we've got these bees that we're able to use. And it's just we've got to start now. Our, our food supply in the world demands it. So when Steve... Um, president of the Real Truth About Health Conference uh, called me up, gosh, a long time ago. He's, he's an amazing um, organized guy, uh, very organized. As he reached out to me, um, I'd never heard of it. I um, went through the past couple speakers of the previous years and um, it, I didn't recognize, um, didn't recognize any of them, to be honest with you. Uh, but what I found as I looked through these was a common, um, uh, common want to tell the truth. Okay? Uh, it wasn't hard to, to come out. Uh, I still had some doubts. The people that were on my particular panel that Steve had positioned me with uh, three other wonderful ladies, um, I wasn't quite sure how this would work out. I had some doubts because I don't really, I didn't know what they knew. Oh my gosh. Just the value, the, the, uh, the interaction that I was able to have here talking with people, but talking with these, um, listening to the people that um, care. I care about bees. These guys care about electromagnetic radiation. These guys, yeah. the, the people that Steve pulled in, I think are um, probably progressive visionaries, not afraid to stand out and tell the truth as they know it. Um, you don't have corporations here. You have people that are trying to winnow their way through these, um, the, the truths. And my only, um, my only caution that as, you know, in this is that there's always the truth as you say. So I've learned um, whoever's out there is going to tell the truth as they know it. And you're, you're going to hear this side and it's all the truth. These people over here are telling the truth as they know it, but in today's society, you kind of have a polarized view. They're both telling the truth, and it's tough to discern what's the middle. And so I hope that I, I didn't catch any of this, but to tell the truth from this perspective, bo leaving both ends off, but here's where I think that the basic truth is. Those are the people that I think um, should be attracted here and um, should, should want to learn.